Tenders are probably one of the most important yet overlooked parts to a large steam engine. And it feels weird talking about a simple box that is effectively the engine's backside. But the history of the tender is long, varied, and more interesting than one may think. At the very beginning of steam, the design of the tender was simple. A box specifically designed to hold excess fuel with access from the cab so the fireman can shovel the fuel into the fire easier. The tender allowed the engine to travel further in between fuel stops. The first type of tender was invented for the Penny Darren as early as 1804. Richard Trevithick's Pioneer engine was a, carried a tender that was a simple four-wheeled wagon which would hold the driver, the fireman and about 200 pounds of coal. The engine wasn't really invented for commercial use, merely to prove a point, and the engine went back to a stationary engine driving a hammer at the Penny Darren Ironworks. The next real innovation came in 1829. The tenders were still four-wheel carts back like they were back in 1804, but more thought had gone into their design. The tenders now carried water tanks, which allowed the fireman or driver to access a larger water source. With water on the go, rather than just relying on the water just in the boiler, allowed the engines to travel even further. It also made the filling of the engine much safer for the crew. Instead of pouring the water directly into the boiler itself and risk serious injury from scalding from depressurized steam, the fireman could fill the tender tanks instead. The boilers would draw the water in, mostly via piston-driven pumps. However, in 1858, Henry Gifford changed this forever with the invention of the steam injector. The injector uses boilers' own steam pressure to pick up low-pressure fluids and force it back into the high-pressured areas. For example, steam from the boiler is allowed to enter the injector. The steam enters the steam cone and it's mixed with low pressure fluid from the tender tanks in the combining cone. The mix is forced through the delivery cone and the water is fed into the boiler with any spent steam or water overflow flowing out of the pipe. All of this is controlled either via valve or by a needle valve with a screw or a pedal. This revolutionized tender design and because the engine didn't have to power its own pump, it made the engines so much more efficient and less to go wrong. As the railways around the world got longer, the engines had to be built were getting larger too, and in turn, so did the tenders. Because of the plentiful supply of water, more attention was given to the tender's fuel capacity rather than its water tanks, but on average it was expected to hold around seven tons in weight. For some, like flying Scotsman in 1923, it was very difficult to keep to time with regular water stops. So in some areas on the main line, troughs were introduced in the middle of the track. Scoops were fitted to the underside of the tender, which connected directly to the water tank. As the engine passed over the trough, the fireman would lower the scoop and the engine's own speed would force the water into the scoop and directly into the tank without the need for stopping. Once the scoop was once full, the scoop would retract and the engine would speed through on its way. Another way to save water was to use a condenser tender. In South Africa, the Class 25 locomotive replaced most of its water tanks within the tender with a massive radiator so that water from the steam can be condensed back into water and used again. It sounds simple, but in reality it was one of the most complex tenders that ever existed. It needed huge amounts of power, an oil separator to separate the steam from the smoke, and two turbines, one to drive both the steam and the condensed water to and from the tender. In the end, it was just too complex and with little economical output, so all the tender radiators were eventually turned into standard tenders, just with longer tanks. The USA took another leap in tender design with the use of a mechanical stoker. The engines used for transporting goods and passengers were massive and had to travel across unique terrain and deal with some of the longest stretches of track in the world. They had to be massive and the big boilers required big appetites. 
The crew, separated from the rest of the carriages by the tender, couldn't just rest or change crew so whenever they needed to. So the mechanical stoker was introduced that fed coal from the tender direct into the firebox. The coal was fed through an auger, a screw-like device, and although it had a tendency to get stuck, it saved many a fireman's back, and firemen could concentrate on the other parts of the engine. In 1901, Cornelius Vanderbilt, the great-grandson to the founder of the New York Railroad, made his own tender. Instead of square like the others, it was circular. The cylinder shape was perfect for oil burning engines and was stronger and lighter than the square counterparts. The US experimented with other designs too, made especially for engines that had to run tender first and, had a, squ and a square shed tender would block most drivers view. Soon sloping tenders and whaleback tenders were common along railroads around the world. Back in the UK, the big railways had yet to catch up, catch up with its continental counterparts and generally mechanical stokers were not really adopted. But the LNER, famous for its passenger services, knew their success would not need to rely on mechanical means. They liked the tried and tested manpower, but recognised that there was only so much a fireman could do, and cabs were small and dangerous for more than just a single crew. Sir Nigel Gresley also didn't like the idea of crews being separated from the rest of the train and the guard by the tender. The LNER decided that to solve the problem, 10 special tenders were produced. They sacrificed some of the tank and fuel capacity for an 18 inch corridor and on the tender's right hand side. The end of the tender would attach to the leading coach and the coach would house additional crew and extra facilities the engine could need. This first coach would become what is now known as a support coach, which nearly every mainline steam engine would haul today. Their initial success prompted nearly every LNER engine to be fitted with this type of tender, and the corridor would allow the crew to swap out. Because of this and the water trough dotted around the mainline, the LNER could for the first time in its history run a train from London to Edinburgh non-stop. In the 1960s after the end of steam, the troughs were removed, so many preserved engines such as Bitten and Flying Scotsman would have a second corridor tender, one to carry the coal while the other would carry water. The use of tenders were not just restricted to steam engines, diesels use them too. Instead of water, the diesel tender will commonly hold extra fuel. Mostly used in larger expanses where stocks were scarce, fuel tenders are a great way for diesels to carry to travel continuously without stopping. The majority of tenders used today carry liquid-fired natural gas, made for engines designed to run on the cleaner fuel. The UK never needed the use for diesel fuel tenders, but they did need the use for brake tenders. These were low heavy wagons that would be coupled to the diesel either behind or in front of the locomotive. Because the diesels were much lighter than steam, they lacked the braking power they needed for heavy loads, especially on gradients. The tenders would provide extra weight and the engine would needed to help stop the wagons. And they were heavy and low so they didn't impede the view of the driver. As fitted braking systems, vacuum and automatic brakes were introduced, the tenders were pushed into sidings and into obscurity. Although rarely used nowadays, if ever, tenders really shaped the railway industry. Nowadays, large steam engines are simply not recognisable without their tender. And it's hard to believe that a simple box used for storage is now an engineering marvel. I can safely say that Wilbur Audrey said it right. Tenders are definitely a mark of distinction, and now everybody knows it too.